couple of things. Uh, tonight we're going to be doing something uh, a little different, and also next Wednesday night, we'll kind of see how this develops. Um, we are going to have no Wednesday night service the week of Vacation Bible School, and we are also not going to have a Wednesday night service the following Wednesday. Um, we're going to do something a little unusual. Uh, it'll probably get me in trouble. Um, we are going to have, I guess, what you would call a staff work day, but it'll be a staff work week. You know how if you have kids in school, sometimes they have a teacher's work day, and the kids stay home and the teachers still go to work? We're going to do that for the week of 4th of July. So 4th of July turns out to be a Monday. And so on the 5th through the end of the week, we will be here working, but we will be closed, per se. We will not be answering the phone. We will not open the front doors. Uh, we won't look at our emails, probably, for, except once a day. And uh, we're going to try to get caught up with a lot of things that need to be done around here and kind of regroup and have some staff time. And uh, we'll have lunch together as a staff every day that week and work together on some things. And so we're going to be doing that. And so I'm not sure uh, if I want to start the study in sort of the typology of the Old Testament with the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, and the feasts. Um, until we get past that, so I'll kind of let you know. Um, I've already been doing some homework <clears throat> to prepare for this, and I'm a long way from being ready. And uh, today I was studying in the book of Exodus, and, you know, these are things that we know, and candidly, I have read and have a fairly good grasp of the bigger picture uh, but as I have been studying it now in a different way, kind of trying to prepare to teach it, to show the typology of what happened uh, in, in Hebrews. You know, we just studied Hebrews. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of all the types. And so now that we have seen the fulfillment in Hebrews, going back and looking at the sacrifices and what they mean in the tabernacle. And so we won't be digging too deep, but it'll be enough. And today, as I was studying uh, for that, kind of in preparation, which is one of the reasons we're doing a video tonight, um, I noticed something that I never th saw before. Uh, and that was that the acacia wood that was uh, given uh, by dimension from the Lord uh, to build the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and overlaid with gold inside and out. Inside of it held the testimony, which is the testament. And that, of course, is the tablets of the testimony, which we know of as the Ten Commandments, the law, the Torah, uh, you know, in, in so many ways. And the mercy seat that is the lid and the cherubim whose wings faced each other and they touched, you know, some way or another. There's artist renderings. Um, but it's going to be like, oh, come on, Paul, you should have known that. Uh, it dawned on me that the mercy seat, at which the cherubim, when they were facing each other on the mercy seat, their faces were to look down at the mercy seat and their wings However, they were pointed, you know, artist renderings are different, you know, I can't, I can't hold that micro, I can't do it, uh, but, you know, the wings would be out, um, that there, the, the mercy seat was overshadowing the law, and I thought, wow, mercy overshadows the law, and I, I just went, wow. And so these are the kind of tidbits that we might come up with. Maybe most of you knew that already. I mean, we've talked about the mercy seat. We've talked about the fact that God's presence dwelt between the cherubim over the mercy seat. The, the mercy seat is pure gold, not acacia wood overlaid with gold. It's a different piece of furniture, really. But, you know, when he starts communicating the law, and remember last week in our Hebrew study, um, 
the author to the Hebrews records in the last chapter where the people said, we don't want to hear from God anymore. We're afraid of him. And, you know, they were concerned about the trembling and the mountain. They, and, you know, they, uh, they heard the, the, the words from the author to the Hebrew uh, or the, hop, the, the Hebrew letter, the author, and to the Hebrew people uh, that he, you have not come to a mountain that is fearful and where you're trembling and where anyone who touches it would be killed. But you've come to the Zion, the city of the great king and the heavenly uh, you know, mountain. Um, and you, know, you look at all that and you realize that the people were afraid to death and that the law God used as a restrainer and to help them to understand their, their weakness. We understand that from the New Testament. But when the law was first given to them, God told them it was to make them have a way to be righteous and we know that they couldn't and we have the epistles after the fact we know that uh, they couldn't fulfill the law they were not good enough and so to have the idea of the mercy overshadowing the law beautiful to me I don't know maybe like I said maybe that's not it's like yeah we knew that already when you go back to kindergarten mister you know kind of thing but uh, awesome awesome um, parking lot, I want to remind you about that. If you're praying about making a contribution, just write building on uh, whatever it is you do. And I don't want you to forget about that. We won't be mentioning it a lot. I'm going to mention it one more time on Sunday probably, and then that'll be it. So we're trusting the Lord, but we do want you to pray about that. Um, I mentioned it on Sunday. If you weren't here, we're going to try to raise about $70,000 to uh, take care of that entire project. And so... Um, we're, we're looking forward to it. Um, I do want to, because it's a Wednesday night, have a little informal moment or two. If you have any questions about that, about why we're doing it or what's going on or how it all developed, um, I realize I gave a two, three minute presentation on Sunday. So if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll try to answer that. And then if not, we will start these two videos. They're 22 minutes long. Uh, each one tonight and uh, likewise next week uh, so a total of 44 minutes of teaching from Dr. Ed Heinsen uh, the distinguished professor from Liberty University and personal friend of mine uh, uh, I want to warn you don't try to take notes and don't open your Bible when he says open your Bible because he'll say you have your Bible open it to Leviticus and by the time you find your Bible he's already in judges I mean it and this is a walk from Genesis to Revelation through the Bible on the prophetic promises and it's an overview it's really good it's very basic um, remember he's teaching 20 year olds uh, these guys are in their 20s generally the, his students at Liberty University they're studying there for their bachelor's, master's, or doctorates. And so they're young people. And he is teaching for young people. But at the same time, these things, these basic things, can to me be very valuable. And I love going back and revisiting them in a walk through the Bible. And so we're going to be able to enjoy those the next couple of Wednesdays together. All right? So we'll have a word of prayer. And uh, the guys will start the video. And uh, we'll go from there, okay? Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your presence and for the privilege we have of enjoying uh, learning together. Uh, we're reminded of our friendship with Dr. Heinsen. We pray for him tonight and for uh, his bride. Lord, that you would touch them and encourage them and their own entire family. Uh, use this video series to encourage and enhance our understanding of the Bible and enrich our faith, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Bible is divided into two major sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament are the Hebrew Scriptures. The New Testament, written in Greek originally, are the message of the Church of Jesus Christ. 
And then each of the Old and New Testament are also divided into four sections each. In the Old Testament, you have the books of the law, the books of history, the books of poetry, and the books of prophecy. In the New Testament, you have the Gospels, and then the book of Acts, the letters or the epistles, and then the book of the Revelation. What we're going to do in four lessons is take a look at what the Bible says is the major prophetic promise of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, from one end of the Bible to the other. So if you have your Bible available, take it. Open it up to Genesis chapter 3 as we begin with the book of beginnings. The book of Genesis simply means the beginnings. The beginning of what? The beginning of the human race and the beginning of the Hebrew race. Uh, the message of the book of Genesis is that God preexisted from all eternity. God has always existed, that he created the world from nothing, brought it into existence, and then created man and woman to know him and have a relationship with him. That's always been the heart of God, a God that loves people, that cares about people, and that wants to bring his blessing into our lives. But as we read the story of Genesis, Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, aren't on the planet very long until they sin against God. And because of that sin, they have a sense of guilt, and they run and hide from God. And God steps into the middle of that fallen moment uh, in Genesis, the third chapter, comes into the garden seeking them, calling out to them, Adam, where are you? Well, we're over here in the trees, he basically says. God asks him, why? What have you done? Uh, Adam immediately blamed Eve for what went wrong, and Eve blamed the serpent, Satan. Uh, Satan has tempted them to sin. They have given in to that temptation, and yet the wonderful promise of the Bible is God steps into that fallen moment, into that place of spiritual darkness, and says to them, in essence, I can help you. He makes the first sacrifice for sin, sheds the first blood, uh, and then gives them the first prophecy of the Bible. So as we look at the books of the law from Genesis to Deuteronomy, the message in the book of Genesis is a promised one is coming in the future. Notice what it says in Genesis 3.15 when the scripture says, as God gives the promise to Adam and Eve, uh, that I will ultimately put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman between your seed and her seed, it will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Many have seen this as the first messianic promise in the Bible. Somebody's going to come into the human race, the seed of the woman, who will eventually crush the head of the serpent. And the interesting thing about that first promise is it was given to Satan himself. God was saying to Satan right from the very beginning, don't think you're going to win this battle. You may have done everything you could to lure Adam and Eve into sin. Uh, and then once you've tempted them, turn right around and accuse them, make them feel guilty, make them want to run away from God. But I am a God who will pursue them no matter what. I will step into the midst of their dark moment, into the midst of their greatest need, and offer them love and forgiveness and hope for the future. What is that hope? It's the hope that someone is going to come into the human race who will ultimately deliver the human race and provide salvation. Uh, as we read along in the book of Genesis, uh, God begins to narrow the field. It's not just any human being, but the field narrows down. By the time you come to Genesis chapter 12, uh, God chooses one man. Abram, great father, and says to him, Abram, trust me, follow me, move to the land of Canaan, and there I will bless you, and I will give you a seed of descendants, and through them I will bless the entire world. Abram believes God. Later, God will change his name to Abraham, or Abraham, the father of a multitude. He is the one that is the chosen one of God through whom the promise will ultimately be fulfilled. In Genesis 15, he's been in the land of Canaan for 10 years. He still does not have a son or a descendant. And he wonders, God, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to adopt my servant, Eleazar? And God says to him, no, you will have a son of your own. Isaac, 
laughter, the son of promise. And as the field narrows in the book of Genesis, we begin to realize that the great promise will come into the human race. He will come as a son of Abraham and ultimately a son of Isaac, then a son of Jacob, Isaac's son, and then Jacob will have 12 sons and the promised line will go to Judah. So by the end of the book of Genesis, we know that the one that is coming uh, is a human being who will step into the human race, the son of Abraham, the son of Isaac, the son of Jacob from the tribe of Judah. Uh, then ultimately the children of Israel or Jacob end up in bondage in Egypt. And in the book of Exodus, you have the story of their exit from Egypt, uh, that God will raise up a deliverer in Moses, will speak to him from the burning bush and reveal himself to him saying, Moses, I am that I am. Uh, go back to Pharaoh. Tell him to let my children go. I have a promise to fulfill to them. I have seen their troubles. I have heard their cries. I am concerned. Therefore, I have come down. God came down in the garden to meet the need of Adam and Eve. God stepped down into history to deliver the children of Israel in the Exodus, and ultimately Pharaoh relinquishes. God is victorious. The children of Israel are allowed to leave, and God delivers them through the Red Sea, uh, ultimately into the wilderness. And there in the wilderness, they come to Mount Sinai, and they receive from God the law. Hence, we call these early books of the Bible uh, the books of the law, or in the Hebrew language, the books of the Torah. Uh, in Genesis, you have a book of beginnings. In Exodus, the exit from Egypt for the children of Israel. Uh, then in the book of Leviticus, named for the Levites or the priests, you have priestly offerings and priestly sacrifices. And Jesus becomes the picture of both the priest uh, and the sacrifice. And then in the book of Numbers, you have the wilderness journey as they count everybody, hence the name, the numbers. They numbered everybody. And then in the book of Deuteronomy, you have the second giving of the law at the end of the wilderness journey. Is the Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 49. Let's trace the promise of God in prophecy. Ultimately, Bible prophecy is not just about what is going to happen in the future. It's all about who is coming in the future. It focuses on the person of Jesus Christ. He's the one that's coming in the future. Uh, he's born under the law of the seed of the woman. He's born under the line of Abraham. So as the New Testament opens, it starts in the Gospel of Matthew by saying, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And we want to trace that in the Old Testament. In the books of the law, the picture of Christ, the son of Abraham, son of Jacob, son of Isaac, of the tribe of Judah. Notice what it says in Genesis uh, 49, verse 8. Uh, as Jacob is about to die and he gives his last will and testimony to his children, he says, Judah is the one whom your brethren shall praise. And the name Judah literally means praise. Uh, for he is the one whose hand will be on the neck of his enemies. And his father's children will bow down before him. They will recognize his leadership. Look at verse 10, he says, For the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, or he whose right it is to rule, the Messiah. Uh, and the gathering of the people shall be unto him. In that passage alone, in Genesis 49, especially in verse 10, we realize the promised Messiah is coming from the line of the tribe of Judah. Uh, the priests would come from the line of the tribe of Levi, hence they would be called the Levites. Uh, but ultimately, the Messiah would come from the line of Judah. That's the tribe that David will descend from. That's the tribe that Jesus will descend from. You see, the wonderful thing about God is God knows the future because God controls the future, because God is the future. And so God takes us down through the corridor of time into the distant future, and he says, says to believers even in the Old Testament, trust me, Adam and Eve, I'm bringing somebody into the human race to crush the head of the serpent, 
Trust me, Abraham, I will make you an Abraham, a great father, and I will bless your descendants through Isaac and Jacob and ultimately through the line of the tribe of Judah. Then as the scripture unfolds, we have amazing prophecies in the books of the law, uh, in the book of Numbers, while they're on the wilderness journey uh, and they're about to enter the promised land. Uh, the king of Moab hires a false prophet to try to curse the people of Israel, but he can't do it. As he opens his mouth, he blesses them instead. Uh, and interestingly, in, in the book of Numbers, in chapter 24 and verse 17, he gives this amazing prophecy. He says of the Messiah, I see him, but not now. He's not here yet. Uh, behold, he will come but he's not nigh, he's not near. Somebody is coming in the distant future who ultimately will be the star that will rise out of Jacob. How did the wise men know to look for a star uh, that had something to do with the birth of the king of the Jews? They probably had access to the Hebrew scriptures and were aware of this prophecy. The star would rise in the future. And then in the book of Deuteronomy, you come to the time when the children of Israel have finished the 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, as they stand on the edge of the promised land, Moses is now over 100 years old. He gives his final statement to the children of Israel, especially to those that have been born in the wilderness. And he reminds them that in the future, God will raise up a great prophet just like me. You find that prophecy in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter. You find it in verse 18. I will raise up a prophet. Uh, in the King James Version, notice it's capitalized. From among their brethren, like unto thee, I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them that which I command him. And uh, whoever will not hearken unto his words, I will require it of him. Uh, the Jewish people were convinced then, on the basis of that prediction uh, in Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, that in the future a great prophet would come who would be like unto Moses, whose words would represent the very words of God himself. Uh, when John the Baptist came on the scene, people came up to him and said, Are you that prophet that should come? They're talking about Deuteronomy 18. And John the Baptist said, No, I'm not. But there he is. And he pointed to Jesus of Nazareth and said, Behold, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In the Old Testament, every time you sinned, you had to go into your flock and get a lamb, take it to the priest at the temple, lay your hands on the lamb, confess your sins, guilty, I did it, and the lamb died in your place. But Jesus, when he went to the cross, became the Lamb of God. He's the one who dies in our place. He bears our sin so that when Jesus dies on the cross, he does not simply die the death of a martyr or of a victim. He dies as a substitute, as a lamb who bears the sins of all mankind. So the message of the books of the law is the promise is going to be fulfilled through a son of Abraham. So someone who will be a star that will rise out of Jacob. The tribe of Judah will provide the Messiah, and eventually a great prophet will come. So as we put the prophecies of the Bible together, someone is coming who's going to be a leader. Somebody is coming who's going to be a prophet. Somebody's coming who's going to die. How do we sort that all out? Well, as we go from the books of the law, we then go to the books of history, uh, from Joshua uh, to Esther. In the book of Joshua, the Israelites leave the wilderness and conquer the promised land. Uh, in the book of Judges, they're trying to hold on to the land, and God judges them as to whether or not they deserve the victory. And then in the little book of Ruth, God uses an Arab girl to marry into the line of the promise, the line of the Messiah. And then in First and Second Samuel, the prophet Samuel anoints men to be kings of Israel so that he begins to give you a picture of the anointed one who's coming in the future. And then in Kings and Chronicles, the emphasis is on the king of Israel, and as the human kings fail, they begin to realize we need a divine king. God needs to be our king. And finally, after the Babylonian captivity, uh, in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, you have the story of the Jews that returned to rebuild the temple in the book of Ezra, 
to rebuild the walls in the book of Nehemiah. And then for those Jews that did not return, the book of Esther tells us what happened to them as God intervened on their behalf to keep the promise. In the books of the law, the emphasis is on the fact that the promised one who's coming in the future will be a son of Abraham. In the books of history, the emphasis is on the fact that he will be a son of David, the great king of Israel. Uh, in the book of Joshua, the Israelites conquer the land under General Joshua. But as he's wondering, how in the world will I ever take that first great city uh, at Jericho? And he's pacing around at night. All of a sudden, the Bible says, a man appeared in front of him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua, with great courage, runs up to him and says, whose side are you on? Ours or theirs? And the man said, neither. But I have come as the captain of the army of the Lord. Whose side are you on? And Joshua, in essence, says, Ha ha, I'm with you. And the angel of the Lord, Christ himself, as he appears in the Old Testament, a divine being. You say, how do you know that? Because when the angel speaks, God speaks. When the angel of the Lord appears, God appears. Take off your shoes, Joshua. You're standing on holy ground. If this is not God the Father, whom the Bible says no man at any time has seen, if this is not God the Spirit who is unseen, then it must be God the Son who takes temporary visible appearances in the Old Testament prior to his permanent appearance in the New Testament. Christ himself comes to say to Joshua, who has the same name as him, Yeshua, Savior, Deliverer. Uh, I am the Savior, the Deliverer, Yeshua. I want you to go in with confidence and trust the fact that God will miraculously deliver the city into your hand. The Israelites conquer the promised land. The name is changed from Canaan to Israel after their forefather. Uh, and then in the period of the judges, there is a time of great instability. Sometimes the people seek the Lord and sometimes they do not. And finally, they realize we really need a king who's like God. Uh, and God intervenes and speaks to the prophet Samuel and tells him, take a horn of oil, go to the town of Bethlehem, find one of the sons of Jesse and anoint him to be the king of Israel. Uh, we read about that uh, in the book of 1 Samuel in the 16th chapter uh, where the Lord says to him, uh, fill your horn with oil, go to Jesse the Bethlehemite, I have provided me a king from among his sons. Samuel, the prophet who's now elderly, says, how will I know who's the right one? And God says to him, I'll tell you who the right one is. And God puts his choice on David, David. David who will in the next chapter kill Goliath. David who will eventually become the king of all Israel, becomes the greatest king that Israel ever had, so that every king in the future is measured by David the king. He's the one who conquers Jerusalem and makes it the capital of Israel. He's the one who conquers the enemies and puts them to flight and spreads the kingdom out to fulfill the promise that was given earlier to Joshua of the borders that Israel would have uh, from Lebanon to Egypt, from the Mediterranean, into the Golan Heights, etc. David fulfilled all of that, passed the kingdom on at his death to his son Solomon, who ruled over that same kingdom. But then as we read on in the books of Kings and Chronicles, uh, among their descendants, some sought the Lord, but some did not. And eventually when you come to the end of the books of Kings and Chronicles, they have so sinned against God uh, that from uh, the time of almost 500 years that have passed, Israel has finally forsaken the Lord, and God then reluctantly takes his hand of protection off of them, and the prophets rise up and warn them, the Babylonians are coming, Jerusalem will fall, judgment will come, because you will not seek the Lord. Now, God was still God. God was still on the throne. The prophetic promise was still certain. It would still be fulfilled in the future. But when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C., burned the city to the ground, destroyed the first temple, Solomon's temple, uh, the average person on the street probably felt like God has abandoned us. God has forsaken us. How and where will his promises be fulfilled? But again, the prophets are told through Jeremiah, the prophecy said, 
The Babylonian captivity will only last for 70 years and it will come to an end. The other prophets predicted that the Jews would return to Jerusalem, that they would rebuild the city and reestablish the promise. Uh, as we read the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther at the end of the section of the books of history, we begin to realize God was still with them. God would enable them to build a second temple in the book of Ezra. Uh, in the book of Nehemiah, God would use him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. They're setting the stage for the New Testament. There has to be a Jerusalem there for the Messiah to come to Jerusalem in fulfillment of the biblical prophecies. And then in the book of Esther, you have the story of the Jews who did not return. Those like Esther who lived scattered throughout the Middle East uh, as she marries the king of Persia uh, and uses her influence to convince him not to exterminate the Jews. Had Xerxes uh, gone ahead and exterminated the Jews as Haman, his advisor, was trying to get him to do, you would have eliminated the line of the Messiah. You see, Satan was still at work, trying to do everything he could to defeat the purposes of God. But God was at work, and God's purpose would not be thwarted. And as you come to the end of the book of Esther, she shouts, If I perish, I perish. I'm going to trust God to intervene. And God indeed did intervene. The promise was maintained. The promise will yet be fulfilled. The power of God is still at work. He has not abandoned his people Israel. He has not given up hope on the world. Someone is still coming. But that's only part of the story. We'll go on in the future and we'll look at the books of poetry and prophecy. We'll get into the New Testament and see how the promise was finally kept. But we've seen enough to realize God is the great promise maker and God is the promise keeper. God intervenes even when you and I have not kept our promises, even when we have failed. God intervened for Adam and Eve. He intervened for Abraham and for Moses, for the children of Israel, for Joshua, for David. Now, even for the kings, when they had failed, God was still at work. And whatever the need is in your life, God is still at work, and he wants to fulfill his promise to you as well. The prophetic promise of God runs all the way through the Bible. He tells you that you know that I am God because I can predict the future. He gives us that reassurance. In fact, nowhere in any ancient literature is there anything like the Bible that makes predictions of future events that actually came true, and especially that made over a hundred prophecies of a person who was coming in the future, and all one hundred of them were literally fulfilled. Promises and prophecies of the coming of Christ himself. We've looked at the first two sections of the Old Testament, the books of the law. The emphasis there is that the promised one is a son of Abraham. And then the books of history, uh, that the promised one is a son of David. And now we want to look at the books of poetry, where we see the predictions of the promised Messiah. And then the books of prophecy, the predictions of the predicted king who is coming in the future. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalms, if you will, and notice that uh, right away in the book of Psalms, the first of the poetic books, there's an emphasis on the king that is coming in the future. Now, there are five books of poetry altogether. In Psalms, you have the songs of praise, where Christ is pictured as the promised Messiah, uh, the Lord of song. In Proverbs, the emphasis is on the wisdom of God. He's the one who's the ultimate epitome of God's wisdom personified. Uh, and then in uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, we have the emphasis on uh, the purpose of life itself. Christ is the purpose and meaning of life. In the Song of Solomon, he's the lover of your soul. And uh, in the book of Job, which sits first in our Bibles, the emphasis is on the fact that he's the coming Redeemer who will ultimately meet our deepest needs. I want to begin with the Psalms, 
and then work our way back, ultimately, to the book of Job. Notice Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage? Why do the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth have set themselves. The rulers take counsel against the Lord and His anointed one, His Mashiach, His Messiah, His promised one, etc., but in verse 6, God says, Oh, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Oh, yes, God would bless the human kings, but ultimately there would come a greater king, a greater son of David, the Messiah himself. God would step into the human race and fulfill these promises. They run all the way through what we call the messianic promises of God or the messianic psalms. Take your Bible and look at Psalm 22, for example, the very words that Jesus quotes from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, etc.? Jesus isn't crying out out of frustration on the cross. He's quoting the Bible itself in fulfillment of the prophecy. You say, well, how do you know this is about him? Look what it says in verse 6, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, despised of the people. Verse 7, they laugh me to scorn, etc. Verse 14, I am poured out like water, my heart is like wax, my strength is dried up, my tongue cleaves to my mouth, I thirst. Uh, in verse 16, they have pierced my hands and my feet, the crucifixion. Verse 18, they part my garments among themselves and cast lots for my clothing. The soldiers gambled for the robe of Christ. No, this psalm, Psalm 22, shouts to us that it's all about Jesus Christ. He's the promised one who is coming in the future. Then in Psalm 23, he's the good shepherd. Uh, in Psalm 22, he's the suffering Savior. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, he leads me in the green pastures beside the still waters. In Psalm 24, uh, he's the king uh, uh, that is coming in the future. Uh, in verse 7 of chapter 24, lift up your heads, O you gates, lift them up, you everlasting doors. Why? For the king of glory will come in. God is going to be the king. God is going to rule. This is not just a psalm about a uh, simple human king uh, over the nation and people of Israel. God himself must be the king. He's the one that they will praise. The doors will swing open for him. As we read through the book of Psalms, again and again and again, we realize the promises are of a coming king, a king that will die, a king that will rise from the dead, and yet will reign and rule in the future. Uh, in Proverbs, notice the emphasis in Proverbs 1.1 1, 1, uh, is the fact that these are the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. Uh, this follows in the Davidic pattern uh, that the Proverbs of wisdom tell us not so much how to get to heaven, but how to get through life, how to deal with the practical issues of life, and how to be successful. In Ecclesiastes, it's again the words of the son of David, who was king in Jerusalem, uh, who's asking the question, what is the meaning and purpose of life all about? From a human standpoint, it all seems worthless, empty, vanity of vanities, worthless, worthless, says the preacher. But yet he finally realizes no significance and value comes from knowing the Lord and keeping his word uh, and being obedient unto him and finding God's purpose for your life. And that purpose is fulfilled to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, and then in uh, the Song of Solomon, it's a love song. Uh, as young Solomon falls in love with a Shulamite girl uh, who has been rejected by her family, she's working in the vineyard. The shepherd boy comes by. It's really the prince disguised as a shepherd. She falls in love with him. He promises one day to return for her, uh, and then he leaves. And in his absence, she dreams about him. And finally, he arrives at her house, and the royal coach rolls up, and she's shocked why it's the coach of Solomon who has become the king. And he comes for this Jewish Cinderella girl, if you will, marries her, takes her to his banqueting hall at the palace, and the Bible says his banner over me is love. A picture of the love of Christ uh, for the bride, the church, as he takes us unto himself. But the first of the books of poetry is the book of Job. Man, everything went wrong in his life. The bottom fell out. In one day, he lost all of his money, all of his possessions, all of his children. And then sometime later, he lost his health. 
When everything is going wrong, the Bible reminds us God is going right. Uh, and uh, Job, finally, out of his frustration, cries out, Oh, that my words were written uh, in a table of lead, engraved in the stones themselves, uh, that somebody would understand my problem. But then he says, in spite of all of that, in Job 19, verse 25, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though my skin is destroyed by worms and my flesh rots, yet in my flesh I will see God. Here is a hope of the resurrection in the Old Testament. How could he say that? Because he's saying, I know that a Redeemer is coming. The promise of God throughout the Bible must be fulfilled. Somebody must step into the human race. A son of Abraham, son of Isaac, son of Jacob, from the tribe of Judah, from the line of King David. A king must come in the future who is the Redeemer. The question is, will he come for you? Remember again, the Old Testament is divided into four basic sections. The books of the law, from Genesis to Deuteronomy, uh, the Torah, or the Pentateuch, the five books. Uh, they emphasize the fact that the Messiah that is coming in the future is going to be a son of Abraham. And then you have the books of history that follow, 12 of them, from Joshua to Esther, where the emphasis is on the fact that the one that is coming uh, is the son of David the king. And then in the books of poetry, there are five of them, the emphasis is on the promised Messiah, the Redeemer. And now we move to the books of prophecy in the Old Testament. There are 12 minor prophets and five major prophets. So the pattern follows all the way through. Five books of the law, 12 books of history, five books of poetry, uh, and then you have five major prophets and you have 12 minor prophets. A prophet was one who received a direct revelation from God himself who could declare the word of God and state, thus saith the Lord. His message was not just his own personal opinion, it was a revelation of God's truth to him. As we look at the major prophets, Isaiah, the prince of prophets, in 66 chapters in classical Hebrew, a, a brilliant written book tells us, again, somebody's coming in the future. Uh, the ultimate prophetic promise is going to be fulfilled, and in Isaiah 7, he tells you the one that is coming is going to be born of a virgin, hence his name and title will be Emmanuel, God with us. God will come into the human race. God will come to meet the needs of a fallen race of people. God will intervene on our behalf. And the New Testament quotes that prophecy as fulfilled in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Behold the virgin, Elma, a unique Hebrew word used only of young women old enough to be married and yet still a virgin. The maiden, the virgin, will conceive and bear a child who is Christ the Messiah. God with us. And then as Isaiah takes you down through the picture of time into the future, he also tells you the one that is coming in the future is indeed going to be a king. He's going to be a divine person who enters human history. Notice chapter 9 of Isaiah's prophecy uh, in verse 6 where he says, For unto us a child is born and a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. He's a king. He's a leader. Uh, but then he goes on to say his name will be this fourfold title, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the El Gabor, the Everlasting Father or the Father of Eternity, and the Prince of Peace. The one that is coming in the future uh, is the Wonderful Counselor. He's the Mighty God, the El Gabor. He's the Abiyad, the Father of Eternity. He's the Shar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. This is not just any human being or any human king. It's God himself. The Mighty God will come to reign and to rule. But then in chapter 53, that shocking prophecy in which he tells us the one who is coming is also going to die for our sins. Uh, if you have your Bible, take it and turn to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Uh, notice verse 3, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In verse 4, now he was wounded for our transgressions. Uh, he was bruised for our iniquities. In verse 5, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Why? Because all of us like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all on him. The judgment of 
God against our sin was laid on him. Uh, and he dies in our place. Uh, his death is that which satisfies the Lord in verse 10 and 11 uh, and brings salvation. Now, this was very difficult for the people to understand in those days. There's a king coming, but there's a suffering servant coming. How do we reconcile those two prophecies? Well, we realize from the New Testament that Jesus does both. Uh, he comes to announce, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand because the king has come. But in his rejection, he's crucified and suffers and dies for our sins in fulfillment of the plan of God for our lives. That was all part of God's purpose in the first place. The one who dies will rise from the dead. That's how he reigns and rules then as king because he's still alive. Uh, that the promise is never diminished by the death of the servant of the Lord who is in fact Christ himself. Uh, in uh, the book of Jeremiah, which follows, Jesus is pictured as the righteous branch who will come in the future, the branch out of David's kingdom that will keep the kingdom alive, though the kingdom seems to have been cut down by the Babylonian captivity, yet a branch will spring forth. Uh, in the book of Ezekiel, uh, the emphasis is on the fact that the glory of God departed from the first temple, uh, that the Babylonians were able to destroy it because God was no longer residing in the box, so to speak, on the Ark of the Covenant. God had left. A uh, darkness had come to the Holy of Holies. God is not the curator of museums. He doesn't just keep old buildings. Uh, in the Old Testament, the tabernacle is destroyed by the Philistines. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. The second temple later was destroyed by the Romans. No, God is concerned about people and their heart response to Him. He wants to rule in your heart. He wants your soul to be the temple of the living God Himself. And yet Ezekiel predicted the glory one day will return. And it returned in the person of Christ. When Jesus was born, the choir of angels assembled, and what did they sing? Glory to God in the highest, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, notice the connection to the prophecies, a Savior who is Christ, Messiah, the Lord. Uh, and then in the book of Daniel, Daniel predicts that yes, a Messiah is coming in the future, but he'll be cut off and killed. And yet he will reign and rule and triumph over the Antichrist. The message of the major prophets is the king is coming, trouble is coming, death is coming to the Messiah, yet life is coming as he rises from the dead, and his kingdom is coming as well. Uh, it's amazing when we read those prophecies. There are over 109 prophecies altogether of the first coming of Christ. Every single one of them was literally fulfilled. Notice again, in the books of poetry, Jesus is the promised Messiah who will come in the future, who will fulfill the aspiration of the heart of man to know the Lord. And in the books of prophecy, he's the predicted king, who not only will come and die for our sins, but will rise from the dead and reign and rule over the whole world. It's the message of the major prophets from Isaiah to Daniel, but it's also the message of what we call the minor prophets. And it's really not the best term for them. Uh, the Jewish people simply refer to them as the Twelve. They're just as inspired as the major prophets. It's just that the books are shorter in nature. And so these little books with these big powerful messages tell us also that a king is coming in the future. Uh, in the book of Hosea, the emphasis is on the fact that God has not abandoned his people and that God is a God of love and forgiveness and of the second chance. Jesus dies for our sins to give us another opportunity for salvation and forgiveness. Uh, in the book of Joel, the emphasis is on uh, the coming day of the Lord, a day of judgment that will come in the future. Uh, in Amos, the message is repent, uh, prepare to meet your God, for one day you'll either face Jesus as Lord and Savior or as your judge. Uh, in the book of Obadiah, uh, that judgment is going to come on the enemies of God. Edom will fall under judgment, and yet God will use that very place to eventually preserve the identity of his own people. Uh, in the book of Jonah, the prophet who ran away, again, God gives him a second chance to go back to Nineveh, to preach to the Assyrians in Iraq, and give them an opportunity of salvation. Why? Because the promise of God in the Old Testament is not limited just to the Jewish people. Just because the Messiah comes through the line of Abraham and David doesn't mean that God isn't concerned about others. 
Now, in the little book of Ruth, Ruth, a Moabite girl, uh, marries Boaz, a Jew, and marries into the line of Christ. She's listed in the genealogy of Jesus. God reaches out time after time to non-Jews to give them an opportunity of salvation. And in the story of Jonah, the whole city of ancient Nineveh repented, uh, and God relented of judgment. Uh, in the little books of uh, uh, Micah and Nahum and Habakkuk, again, the emphasis is a Savior is coming in the future. A King is coming. Uh, in Zephaniah, there's one final call for revival. And then Haggai, the Jews after the Babylonian captivity are to rebuild the temple. And in the book of Zechariah, the King is coming. And in the book of Malachi, Elijah will come to prepare the way for the King. Let's take a look at those last two books in particular. Uh, take your Bible and go to the book of Zechariah, if you have your Bible available to you, and look at chapter 12. Uh, as Zechariah gives us these incredible predictions, a king is coming, riding into town on a donkey. Uh, the people are shouting, Hosanna, fulfilled when Jesus on Palm Sunday entered into Jerusalem, and the people waved the palm branches and shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But then... Zechariah also tells us he will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and indeed he was, uh, that he will eventually be crucified and yet rise and rule. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. Uh, look at uh, the middle or the end of verse 10. I will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication or prayer, and they will look upon me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, etc. They will call out to me whom they have pierced. A clear prediction of the crucifixion of Christ as he's pierced through his hands and his feet uh, and his side. Uh, and yet he says in chapter 13, there will be a fountain open to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness, a fountain of cleansing through what? Through the blood of Christ himself. And then in the 14th chapter, he tells us, all the nations will one day gather against Jerusalem to fight against her, but the Lord will go forth in verse 3 of chapter 14 and fight against those nations. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives and split it in half. And that has never happened in the past. That is yet to happen in the future when the king comes. Uh, what an amazing prophecy. Zechariah sweeps you down through the halls of history into the distant future and says, the king is coming, riding on a donkey, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, yet the king that is coming will be pierced and crucified. The people will mourn for him. He will rise from the dead and he will come to reign and rule. And when he comes back the second time, he'll split the Mount of Olives in half. And then the last book of the Old Testament, uh, the little book of Malachi, the final message of prophecy given around 400 B.C. Uh, that takes you from the time of Abraham at about 2000 B.C. to the time of Moses at about 1400 B.C. to the time of David at 1000 B.C. Now we're all the way down to 400 B.C. The last message of the last prophet who says to you in chapter 4 in the last passage in the Old Testament, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And the Old Testament ends. It's the prediction of the coming of Elijah that the Jewish people are still looking for. And yet Jesus said, when asked, what about that prophecy? He said, I tell you, he's already come in the person of John the Baptist. He's the one that came to prepare the way for the coming of the King, the rightful Messiah of Christ Himself, calling the people to come unto Him. Otherwise, they'll fall under the judgment of God. As wonderful as the Old Testament is, I, I teach it at Liberty University to over a thousand students every semester. I, I have all kinds of degrees in Old Testament and archaeology and studies of that nature. Uh, I've studied the Hebrew language, Aramaic, Akkadian, uh, but as great as the Old Testament is, as exciting and powerful as its message is, as its hope of promise is, it ends with a dull thud. It starts with, in the beginning, God created the world. And it ends with, lest I come and, boom, strike the earth with a curse. Why? Because if you don't know the one who is the epitome of the law of God and the grace of God and the power of God, you come under the judgment of the law, which was the judgment of the curse. You either get the blessings 
or you receive the curse. You see, the Old Testament is not complete without the New Testament. It's in the New Testament we finally understand who is this one that is coming through the human race, through the line of Abraham, through the line of David, the promised king of the future. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And as we move on in our study of the New Testament, we'll discover how the promise is kept, how it's fulfilled, and how it can be guaranteed to your own life as well.